Why don't we begin with an opening prayer? Y'all ready? Marion? Let us join together in a moment of prayer as we prepare ourselves for worship. Lord, we just want to thank you for this day, this Sunday morning, that you got us up, that you allowed us to come and be a part of this worship, to worship with one another in person and in cyberspace. Lord, we thank you for walking with us through the week and carrying us forward at moments and at times that we felt that we were either too tired or weak to carry ourselves, you lifted us up and you held us. And so, Lord, we just want to give you the praise and give you the thanks and give you the honor this morning. Give you the glory. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. pray. And the people of God said amen, 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 and amen. and brothers, I greet you with the joy this morning and with the love of Jesus. We welcome you to our service and sanctuary, and we greet you, our online participants, as well as sisters and brothers from Florida, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, Tennessee, Illinois, New York, Georgia, Michigan, and the great state of North Carolina. If you want your state mentioned, just let us know from what state you're viewing. And, if, and please remember to tell others they can join our worship through our website at www.plymouth-ucc.org, Plymouth Facebook page, or through YouTube. Either way, we are thankful that we can worship together whether we are near or far. My name is Wendy Farmer, and our senior pastor is Reverend Graylin Scott Hagler, and I welcome you on behalf of the ministers, officers, and the members of Plymouth Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. I greet you from the nation's capital, a colony seeking to become the 51st state. Welcome. We are advocates for vaccination, science, and being sane. And we urge you to take every opportunity to get vaccinated if you have not. If you are in the sanctuary today, you are required to wear a mask, use hand sanitizer, and engage in safe practices. If you are not comfortable coming into the sanctuary and church facilities just yet, or if you reside in another state, you can continue to join us via the internet. We will continue our programs and learning ministries during the week. You are invited to join us for Bible study on Tuesdays, Wednesdays for our dial up and power up prayer call. Our spiritual grounding sessions are Fridays at noon. Join us 
in one or all three of these dynamic sessions. We are still here, here at 5301 North Capitol Street Northeast in Washington, D.C. We are thankful and honored that you are joining us this morning, physically and even through cyberspace. We are a church of deep history, progressivism, and liberation. We have been a community of faith since 1881. That's right, this is our 140th anniversary year. If you have been blessed by these services over the last year and live in the area, then we hope you will bless us with your presence. If you are not physically here in the sanctuary, let us know of your desire to officially become part of this ministry of Jesus Christ. We hope that you will join with us in this work of love, this passion of justice, and this mission of Jesus from the corner of this world, to this world. We, wel we worship, we praise the Lord, we examine issues in our world. Worship is a time to gain perspective, to refuel, to regain strength for the continued work ahead. We continue working towards freedom, justice, and wholeness. We continue to work towards the manifestation of the perfection of God. We embody that, we embody what Fannie Lou Hamer said, nobody is free until everybody is free. So come worship and lift praises because this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, Clements. This is our call to worship this morning. Psalms 135, verses 1 through 4 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, you who serve the Lord, you who serve in the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Celebrate his lovely name with music, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself. Israel for his own special treasure. That is Psalms 135, verses 1 through 4. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, King of glory, faithful Father, we adore your name and glorify you forever. Father, it is by your will that we are alive and healthy, and you have given us the grace to converge this morning. You promised us, Father, that whenever we call your name, you will answer us with your presence and make your blessings abundance in our gathering. As we start this service this morning, from the beginning to the end, glorify yourself and make us satisfied in you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite those here to stand and join in singing number 157 in the African American Heritage Hymnal, To God Be the Glory. And those of you at home, I invite you to sing at the top of your voice, To God Be the Glory, if you know this hymn. Amen. <laughs>
in mind. We are praying for the family of Isabel Carmichael, who made her transition this week. We are praying for the family of Barbara Meadow, as Reverend Hagler's sister. Keep the family of Macy O'Kemp in your prayer, our former 8 a.m. musician. A memorial service will be held for him at Plymouth next Saturday, August 7th at 12 noon. We're also remembering to pray for Ida Jackson, Donald Monet, Dolores Tucker, Kyle Smith, Rhett Lucas, Joe Johnson, Leroy and Sarah Ellison, Beverly Gallimore, Deacon Gloria Norris, Brother Bracy, whose nephew was in an accident, and others. Strengthen each other, bless each other, and guide them in their recovery, renewal, and healing. Pray that God will continue to intervene in all the situations in a bold and healing way. Pray for those who are ill, depressed, and for people feeling the anxiety of the times. Pray for people who are depleted and needing to be lifted out of sorrow and despair. Pray for people looking for a positive breakthrough in their lives. Pray for others in all conditions and circumstances that they may be in. Pray for the redemption of the nation that it might rid itself hatred, and the sin of racism and white idolatry. Pray for those who are unemployed, laid off, and underemployed. Pray that we all might be healed in body, mind, and spirit. Pray, work, and pray some more. Father God, we come humbly to the throne of your presence. Father, we know that you are able to answer all our needs. Father, there simply is none like you. You are set apart. You sit high and you look low. You are sovereign. You're omnipresent, you're omnipotent, and you're omniscient. Father, we seek your face, we seek your love, we seek your heart, we seek your healing hands, your divine glory, Father. Father, we press towards you because we know that deliverance is where you are. You desire to heal us. You desire to comfort us. You desire to fulfill every need that we have. And you're more than capable. And so, Father, we look no other place than you because you said we are your children. We are your heir and co-heirs. Father, we just thank you right now for all the prayers that are being answered, all the healing, the deliverance, the breakthroughs. We thank you in advance right now, Father, for the people who are financially strapped, 
We thank you, Father, for the money that is coming to them. We thank you, Father, for the employment that's coming to the unemployed. We thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy. Father, we just bless your name right now. We love you. We adore you. It is in your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, saints. This is the moment of praise. So what I want you to do is to everybody to stand up. If God got you up this morning and he got you here, we have to praise him and let him know that we thank him. So I want you to sing with gusto and as loud as you can. This moment of praise. Somebody pray for me. today and it's entitled his strength 
and song. He gives me strength from day to day to face whatever comes my way. He lifts me to great heights above and reassures me of his love. He walks with me when days seem long and puts into my heart a song, a lovely tune with sweeter words that even stills the sounds of birds. But for a moment, then they sing more sweeter songs the Savior brings, songs that lift a heavy load when trudging down a lonesome road. He is my hope, my joy, my life, who keeps me safe through the storms and strife. I'd not be able to carry on without his strength, without his song. May you have a blessed day. And now, we are going to greet each other and pass the peace. We're going to give those holy air hugs, those fist bumps, and elbow bumps, and those watching, you can greet those around you as well. Have a blessed day. Amen. Amen.
just found out really hot. Amen, amen. So uh, that's still, still moving, clicking, and doing. And I mean, when I just read, I said, God was on the drama. So we always give faith to Isaiah. church's website, www.plymouth-ucc.org, under the videos. It'll play live there. Uh, you can also go to YouTube and get it live and record it. Uh, and if you don't have any of that stuff and you just will do a, a podcast, you can also get it on podcasts that will play for you. So there's a number of ways. There's no reason for you to listen worship service, amen? And you know, I, I always joke uh, uh, with Dr. Reed, because Dr. Reed comes on our, uh, one of our sessions on either Tuesday or Friday, and he's always driving. So I just want to make sure he keeps his eye on the road, but he's got the audio on so he can hear everything that's going on, so he hasn't even slowed down in his work day. And, uh, and I just lift that up because, you know, there's so many ways in which we can stay in touch with each other and we give thanks and glory to God for all of those ways that have been presented to us. Now we invite you to spend at least one more additional hour with us during the week. You're invited to join us in Bible study on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We started the book of the prophet Hosea. Our spiritual grounding session is on Fridays at 12 noon and this Friday we will have uh, our Reverend uh, 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 Kemp, Father Kemp, actually Father Kemp from Georgetown University who will be our spiritual grounding uh, presenter. Some of these gatherings take place on the Go to Meeting platform and others will take place through Facebook webpage. Our Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. Dial Up and Power Prayer Line is a dial-in gathering. I want to thank Reverend Garrett Jordan for his constant uh, support and leadership of that as he has been away. I know Sister Leola and also Beatrice Kelly, Deacon Beatrice Kelly, have been holding down the fort on that prayer line and we just give thanks uh, for all of that. All this information is in your e-newsletter. If you do not get the church's e-newsletter, then that simply means that you're not on the email list. And you can get on the list by sending to us your email address, Plymouth at Plymouth Congregation. Or Plymouth Congregation or Yahoo.com or directly to me, Reverend Hagler at G S H A G L E R, G S Hagler at Verizon.net. Important information is distributed through that e newsletter. Now, as we continue to move and celebrate our 140th anniversary, we had Bobby Feldon and friends uh, in concert last Sunday here in the sanctuary. And coming up on Saturday, August the 21st, from 12 to 4, will be our Summer Bash. And that will be a blast. Our Summer Bash that will be a blast as part of our 140th anniversary celebration. And join us for an afternoon of laughter, fun, and fellowship. Now, the church's uh, annual meeting, uh, uh, we passed a new and very minimal budget of $821,000. And this includes the mortgage payment and the construction that is now part of our expenses. We need to have adequate rental of our church facilities on a use basis and on a continual basis to meet our budget. We will look for further opportunities that are congruent with our mission and ministry to help us meet our goal. Now, tithing is one way to help the church, as a tithe helps to guide us in our giving. Generally speaking, the tithe is 10%. Another way to look at the math uh, is uh, of meeting our goal is that if 200 people gave $79 per week over 52 weeks of the year, that would successfully secure the budget. 
or 150 people averaging at least $105 per week over 52 weeks would secure our budget. I can say that there are numbers of members right now and friends of Plymouth already giving better than this, and we thank you profusely for your generosity and commitment. Now, some cannot do as much, but the perfection of the community of believers is that everyone can do their genuine part, and God will do the rest. Do your best, and God will bless. And, and I just want to point out, because, you know, sometimes people get caught up in the impossibility of the law. But God doesn't show us impossibility. God shows us the possible. That God may take us into a seemingly difficult situation and work it all out so that we are able to really see the victory and understand what God can do. Amen. Now, you know, the church has been here 140 years. It's going to be here long after I'm gone. Uh, and uh, it's going to be here long after you're gone. But we plant the seeds of the future right now. And so I want to just thank all of you, faithful members and friends that continuously give and act in a spirit of possibility. Those who continuously give out of their gratitude and thankfulness to God. It really demonstrates how people want to keep a liberating and progressive interpretation of God's word alive and thriving. We thank all of the people who are always sending their tithes and contributions to one of the methods that have been made available. And many even give right now as this appeal is being made. You can give through the church's website, www.plymouth-ucc.org, www.plymouth-ucc.org. Uh, and you can find on that donation page all of the other methods that have been made available. You can give by cash app. Our cash tag is dollar sign Plymouth, D.C., and you can give through Givelify and find us as Plymouth Congregational Church in Washington, D.C. If you pay your bills through your bank's online bill pay, you should consider making Plymouth one of those payments, uh, and it, the bank will even pay the postage for you. Or you can send in your tithe contributions and support the old-fashioned way, which is through the mail, Plymouth UCC, 5301 North Capitol Street, Northeast, Washington, D.C., 20011. However you give, we thank you for your love of the church, for your embrace of the good news of Jesus, and for blessing this liberating manifestation of God's word. Now, also, offering plates are here at the front of the church, and those in the sanctuary can make their work way down the aisle to place their tithes offering and gifts in those plates. Let us join in prayer as we prepare to give. Lord, we thank you for all of the gifts that you have given to us and all of the mercy that you have shown to us. Lord, we know that every precious thing has come from you, that you've carried us through and brought us over, that you lifted us, Lord, when we were down, that you fed us, Lord, when we were hungry and took the week before. Lord, you gave to us your living water and you gave to us the hope and presence of your salvation. And so, Lord, we thank you for all these gifts and we know that these gifts cannot be bought. But one thing we do know is that we can keep your word thriving and lifted up so that somebody might be touched and healed and blessed. So, Lord, we give this offering, these times, as a token of our gratitude and thankfulness, and we give it to the glory of God. Lord, you filled us uh, with every good thing, put a roof over our head, and clothes on our back, and woke us up this morning, Lord, and we can't pay you back for that, but we can give, we can give, so that somebody else might be blessed. As we receive these times, Lord, we give you the praise, and we give you the thanks. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. People of God said amen, 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 and amen. amen.
found in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to 13. 2 Samuel tw- chapter 12, verses 1 to 13. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up. And it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guests who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have anointed you king over Israel, and I have rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of God to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son for you did it secretly but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to God, now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. May God add a blessing to the reading of that word. Amen. Now since we don't have that great and dynamic voices here of Garrett Jordan, Reverend Garrett Jordan, or Kenneth King, I'm going to proceed to lift up our teaching message today. And I want to ask that you would join me in a moment of prayer. Lord, we come to you and just give you thanks for this day, this time, this opportunity to examine this world and to see what it may be saying to us in this time in which we stand, these moments in which we live. For one thing is always certain, Lord, and that is that you are the potter and we are the clay. So mold and shape us as you would have us to be until we are perfectly fitted for your kingdom and able to call ourselves disciples of Jesus the Christ. Now as we come to this teaching moment, Lord, you hone and you shape it, you develop and you send it forth as you see fit. Allow it all to be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I want to speak for a little bit on the subject we all have contradictions. We all have contradictions. Now the story of David continues. 
And I say that because if you were with us last week, you know that I started with this story. You remember that David summoned Bathsheba after watching her bathe on the roof. And he impregnates her and attempts to trick her husband into thinking that the baby is his. He brings Uriah home from the front lines of war in hopes that he will sleep with Bathsheba and in doing so, they can fool Uriah into thinking that the child is his. But Uriah is filled with a sense of solidarity with his fellow soldiers in the field. So instead of coming home and eating and drinking and making merry, he sleeps in the soldiers' quarters. He does not go home as opposed to the conniving and evilly devised plans of David, there are some people who have scruples and are bound by a sense of right and wrong and of duty. It is difficult for David to imagine this kind of discipline, and therefore he concludes that his trickery is fruitless, and he gives a note to Uriah to deliver to his commander, Joab. And the letter says, put Uriah in the heat of the battle and withdraw the other troops so that Uriah is killed in battle. It happens in exactly that fashion. And they give Uriah a hero's funeral and loads him for his patriotism, for his duty to the king, and for his valor. They probably even put a purple heart on him as a medal for somebody who was a hero. They gave him a hero's funeral, probably draped in a flag over his coffin. And they spoke very highly of him and all of his attributes. And the commander and the king's full-throated admonishment to the other soldiers was to live up to the standard and discipline that Uriah exemplified. And they laid him the rest with full military honors. 21 gun salute. Somebody folding the flag and presenting it <clears throat> to his next of kin. And David's body was laid to rest. David felt that he had dodged a bullet, so to speak. All that is left to do is to proceed through the proper mourning period. <clears throat> Act as if nothing improper happened. And after an appropriate time, David could bring her into his house. She could become one of his wives. And in due time, a child would be properly born to them. <coughs> Sorry, y'all. It happened just like that. David had literally gotten away with murder. How many times on one of those sensational television programs have you seen this scene? <coughs> someone meets someone, but someone's with somebody else. Maybe a wife or a husband. And a plan is hatched to get rid of one so that the other can be with the one. We've voyeuristically watched the episodes play out. Witness how one shred of evidence lead to another until finally the concocted story unravels and justice in the end is done. Or someone wants the payout of the life insurance. Or all... <clears throat> the inheritance, and similar twisted plans come into being. <clears throat> but why would and how could people think 
that they can get away with such a dastardly deed, such an immoral deed, such an unethical deed. Yeah. And why would someone resort to murder mm -hmm. to right a wrong yeah. that they are doing or have done? Mama. We call this a cover-up. Yeah. Often we try to cover up wrongdoing with more wrongdoing. Yeah. A lie with a lie, yeah. and a sin a with sin. more sin. Yeah. I've been teaching that the story of David is a story of brokenness, the struggle of the human personality, and the temptations we encounter, and not the brokenness or flaws that God is able to use. Now, God can use that, but that's not the focus of the story. For the story has been used to justify the actions of all kinds of despots in our history. God does not bless despotic behavior, but wants us to see into it and see through it for what it actually is. So this story is about the temptation of the human personality to try to always get over and get away with yeah, something. Yeah. The struggle. You see, if we take the latter explanation that, that, that this is simply God is able to take a flawed somebody like David and make something out of somebody who really is flawed, then we really miss the whole part of the story and that explanation is too simplistic and misses the complex dynamics of blind ambition, the clawing to acquire power, and the tempting impulse to believe that the laws and the standards applied to others does not apply to us. That's what's entailed in this story. David who says, I can get away with anything as long as I can get away with it. I can tell you anything as long as you believe it. I can stretch the truth, I can bend the truth, I can break the truth because I'm really above all of those kinds of norms that I want to apply to others. David had thought he had gotten away with his sin, his murder, and his deceit. And there was, however, a prophet in David's household. And the prophet Nathan came and he congratulated the king and Bathsheba on the birth of their child, and they graciously accepted Nathan's congratulatory expressions. But what they did not know yeah. was that Nathan could count. Tell me. And Nathan counted one, two, three, four, uh -huh. five, Five? <laughs> Five? Yeah. Aha! Uh -huh, he declared to himself. You see, what this is really saying is that somebody will always find out your stuff. Someone will always discover how you tried to get over, how you cut a corner in order to get there. Someone will always see your sin and your shortcomings even when you think that you've gotten over and got away with it. Yeah. This means that no matter how smart we are, how slick we may think ourselves, or how cunning we regard ourselves, we will always be found out. Yeah. We may not be found out this time, and we may not even be found out next time. Tell it. But getting away with something or thinking that we have gotten away with it can be an addictive and can, can be addictive and can lead to a lifestyle of getting over, deceit, lying, untruthfulness, but soon if not later, we will be found out. Yeah. Do you know somebody? Because most of us do. Do you know somebody? That when they open their mouth, you know they're not telling the truth. 
Do you know somebody that every time they open their mouths, it might be based on truth, but it gets stretched far beyond the truth time? And so even when they come and tell you the truth, you don't believe it because you know them in their untruthfulness. That happens all the time. What was that story? The sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. The fact is, is that we get used to the stories that come out of people's mouths and out of those that we know because we found out somewhere along the way that they were not truthful. So, it's best not to go there in the first place. Because lying to excuse our lies only makes it a bigger lie and a deeper sin. Someone is always watching. And someone will find out what we think that we've hidden. And so David, so Nathan tells David a story. He says, there are two men in a certain city, king. One rich, the other one's poor. And the rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little old ewe, which he had bought. He brought it up, and he grew up with him and his children and used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom and it was like a daughter to him now there came a traveler to the rich man and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare it for the wayfarer who had come to him so he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guests who had come to him now David being a man who wanted to project himself as a just king reacts to the story. He bellows, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan listened to David's outrage and sense of righteousness. And when the tirade subsided, Nathan cornered and declared, you are that man. Yeah. David's sin had been found out. David's cover-up was uncovered. And he stood before the prophet Nathan and before God with the secrets and lies that he thought was guarded, exposed. What I find interesting in the text is that David could be outraged at someone's unjust act, but not at his own. Mm -hmm. Said that the man deserved to die. He could look at somebody else's actions and, and, and judge those actions, but not look at himself and judge his own actions. This reminds me of the holier than thou people in churches looking at scorn like with scorn with everybody else in church. Tell it. There are people who can see the sin and blemishes in someone else, but never in themselves. Tell it. I know about folks whose homes were in disrepair. I'm talking about in terms of in terms of family relationships, but they, they never talked about that, but they had a tendency to talk about everybody else and what was going on in everybody else's family rather than what was going on in their own household and in their own families. What does it say? Live in a glass house, you should not throw stones. Yeah. There are people who can see the sin and blemishes in someone else but never in themselves. And Jesus challenges his followers in Matthew chapter 7. He says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but do not notice the log in your own eye? Well, how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Stop talking about folks. I call this contradiction. 
contradiction because we know what's going on with us, in us, around us, but we don't want to admit it, we don't want to see it, we rather ignore it, and we rather point out what's going on in somebody else's life. Yeah. And we usually don't analyze what's going on in somebody else's life privately either. Y'all know what I mean. You gotta find a little audience to talk about somebody with. Right. That's what we call gossip. Our contradiction. Our sense of righteousness, justice, wrong and right is applied to those around us, and yet we generally excuse, ignore, and deny the injustice, sin, and wrong in ourselves. David was just that. David was filled with the contradictions of projecting himself as right, just-minded, and people caring, when in fact, very little of that was real. This was David's contradiction. And this is the contradiction often in us. When we look at where we are as a country, and in the world today, we see contradictions. We hear people pushing lies and deceit. We hear people talking about the steal, meaning last November's election where there was no steal. There are the contradictions of David and the contradictions today. Under the guise of voter protection, Republican-controlled legislatures across the country are passing laws to make sure that it's harder to vote All these bills are targeted at black and brown people who turned out numbers to overturn a racist and xenophobic president. But to these Republicans across the country, something must be wrong, they reason, because what happened allowed the votes of the voters who have been suppressed since the invention of America to vote. So we got to find ways in order to stop them from voting. We had poll taxes before. We had, tell me how many jelly beans are in this jar of jelly beans in order for you to get the right to vote. We had all those kinds of devices that were in place and the voting rights bill did away with all of those arbitrary measures to keep people from voting. And here we are now with one state house after another attempting to pass legislative pieces to keep people from voting. This is a part of the historical suppression of voices in America. This is our contradiction. Because a democracy requires greater inclusion and greater voices and more votes and not less. David thought he had gotten away with murder and sin. You see, when you look at the story, you realize that he wraps himself in patriotism. He wraps himself in the flag. And he mentions God when it seems expedient to do so. And he never saw in himself as an unjust and conniving person until the prophet Nathan pointed it out to him. He didn't see it on his own, but he saw it because it was exposed. Don't wait to find, to have somebody find you out. Don't live life in the shadows of just simply trying to get over and cut whatever corner you think you can cut. The message here is simple. Be truthful. Be righteous. Be just, be kind, be real in your actions and in your thinking. Stop thinking about what you can get away with, but make certain that what you do and how you do it is ethical, right, and just. Be just because God and you will know it and remember. Someone will see you for who you are. Yeah. 
And even if you don't recognize your own contradiction, someone else will see it. Therefore, be humble. And be honest. Yeah. And be real. And ready to guard yourself from wrongdoing and the wrong thinking of what you think you can get away with and seek to always do right. Yeah. Nathan reminded David of how blessed he is. If you look down at that text, speaking in the voice of the Lord, Nathan said, I appointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. In other words, God is saying, I've given you everything, and yet you're not satisfied. Whatever you have, you seem to want more. Whatever blessings you have are never good enough. Whatever possessions you have, you just simply want more. And whatever honor and prestige you have been given, you're never, never at ease with. Instead of looking at what you think you don't have, look at what you have and give thanks for it. Be grateful for it. And stop seeking after the things that cause you to lie and engage in deceit uh, uh, out of blind ambition and out of also that sense of want where you do not have. Don't allow your spirit and soul to be tainted with the temptations of your desire. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, Verse 11b to 13. For I've learned to be content with whatever I have. Yeah. I know what it is to have little. Yeah. And I know what it is to have plenty. Yeah. In any and all circumstance, I have learned the secret of being well fed. Yeah. And of going hungry. Of plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Praise God. You see, he, he's, he's basically saying here, just trust in God more. Yeah. Look to God more. Love God more yeah. than the contradictions of living. Love God more than what you think you need to have or want to have. Love God more than what you think is desirous. Love God more than the temptation of your heart and of your soul. Love God more than the things that you have been tempted with by the commercialism of America. Love God more than all of those possessions and shiny objects that you see around you. Love God more than any and everything. And if you love God more, the contradictions of living will fade. And our genuine God-loving self will emerge. This is what the walk and talk and the teaching of Jesus were all about. Loving God with all our hearts, all our souls, all our minds, all our spirit. All our strength. Yeah. Trusting in God and not the devices of our own minds. Knowing that it is God who uplifts. God who blesses. And God who can tear down. Just that God sends a king by the name of Jesus. God sends a king who does not reside in a palace. God sends a king who's not dressed in fancy robes. God sends a king whose feet are dirty. God sends a king who goes and and lives among the poor. God sends a king who heals the leper. God sends a king who does the things that kings do not 
do in order to show us what it means to live in the grace and goodness of God. Praise God. God sends a different kind of king to teach us what it means to love God, yeah. what it means to walk with God, what it means to trust in God. I remember the days in which I was homeless. Y'all heard me. And you know, that's a contradiction because I don't ever want to think of myself as homeless. So I've always not thought of myself as homeless, but I was homeless in Chicago. Didn't have a place to stay in Chicago. Stayed on the streets in Chicago. Panhandled in order to get some money to get a little flock house room every now and then so I could get off the streets of Chicago and get a little shower. The contradictions of that, I want to just think that well, somehow I've never been in that place, but I've been in that place. And, and, and when we confess it, then we realize that it was not I that got out of that situation, but it was God who brought me through. Praise God. It was daring to believe that, that God's word was true and God was able to supply a breakthrough. And yes, I wanted more out of life, but I continued to walk along in that space until God revealed what God was ready to reveal. You see, everybody wants a, something better and something greater, more cleanly. Bigger car, better career, more money, yeah. a bigger house. Yeah. Folks want a living room you don't live in, and a dining room that you can die in. Right? Everybody wants something bigger, but the fact is, is that God will deliver when God is ready to deliver. So you stop all of your desires yeah. and be contented with what God has provided you. That's why we're reminded in the scripture is that if we're faithful in a little, God will make us faithful in much. Yes. That's because as we go along in our trials and tribulations, that is our testing ground for the purity of our heart. That's the testing ground for our sense of morality. That's our testing ground for our sense of justice. That's our testing ground for ethical living. And if we're faithful in little, God will surely make us blessed and faithful in much. Somebody just trust in God, believe in God, love God, and now allow your trust in God to allow the contradictions in yourself to fade and your genuine living to emerge. A word today about a change of ourselves, a change in our heart, a change in the way we live. Your contradictions. God wants to deal with it. The lies that we tell ourselves and tell others. God wants to deal with it. The deceit that we live in. God wants to deal with it. The shadows that we hide in. God wants to deal with it. The myths that we tell ourselves. The way in which we artificially puff ourselves up. God wants to deal with it. For God wants your legitimate, genuine self to emerge. The thing and the person that God has created to emerge. God created the heavens and the earth and God created you also. Allow the creation by which God created you to be. I pray somebody may have heard a word or a message. Somebody may want to give to themselves this faith walk today. Give themselves to Jesus. You know, it's about being able to walk along and discipline and to come to a new realization morning after morning. New blessings I see. We remind ourselves that if we go to the humble message of Jesus, we might find ourselves. So I'm praying today that somebody might find themselves. Somebody might be healed emotionally and psychologically. Somebody might say, come into my heart, Jesus, and save me. Give to me some comfort. Give to me some peace. Not as the world gives it. Give me a peace that goes beyond.